I am most excited, I think, about this message. Not because I don't believe in all the others. I do. And I'm very grateful to Skip for uh, not only inviting me back here. You know, the first time a pastor invites you, maybe they don't really know who you are and they're just rolling the dice, as it were. That's probably not a good analogy. But, um, <laughs> but when they invite you back, um, you know, it's a really, it's a, it's a tremendous honor. And um, and to be able to do this series, obviously, uh, I do believe, scripturally, that Jews are the chosen people, which as a Rosenberg, you know, I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, <laughs> you know, I do believe that God has given the land of Israel to the Jewish people um, sovereignly. He just decided to do that. He didn't have to, um, but he, he did. And, and the reason people hate Israel is because God chose them, and God wants to bless them, and God wants to show himself to the Jewish people, and then through the Jewish people to the rest of the world, and Satan hates it. Absolutely, and, and this, this has been what we've been talking about, these two great threats to Israel and the Jewish people. One is radical Islam, and one is replacement theology. One, uh, the radical Islam, is to, threatens to annihilate the Jewish people. It threatens them with annihilation. Replacement theology threatens Israel with delegitimization, that there's, there's that God is done with the Jews, that he's finished with the Jews, that he has no plan and purpose for the Jews. And in fact, this replacement theology teaches the Jewish people, all those promises that went to Jews and to Israel, have, they now only go to the church. And the church has just replaced Israel as the apple of God's eye. And we looked at those and, and, and understood those scripturally as not true. So to recap, for those of you that weren't with us, yes, the Bible teaches that Jews are the chosen people. Yes, the Bible teaches that God gave all of the promised land to the Jewish people as an everlasting possession. That's the term, that's the phrase that the Bible uses, an everlasting possession. And I asked in the previous service, doesn't everlasting mean everlasting? It does. But, okay, now having set that up, let me say but. But, let's be absolutely clear that this does not mean that God hates Israel's neighbors. It doesn't mean that God has given the Jewish people a license to oppress their neighbors or given Jews permission to create injustice. That's not what the scriptures teach at all, and we're going to look at that. To the contrary, I want to say as a Rosenberg, as a Jewish person who loves Jesus, that God loves the Palestinians. God loves the Syrians. God loves the Lebanese, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Iraqis, the Iranians, he loves the, the, the Saudi Arabians, those in the Gulf states. He loves all of those people in that region. He loves them so much that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for them as well, to rise again for them as well. He's coming back for them as well, if they will but receive Christ as their Savior. God, their, their well-being, the, the, the well-being of the neighbors in this world and in the world to come should matter to us because it matters to God. Genesis 17, turn with me to Genesis 17, and we're going to begin this because we know that God describes himself as the God of Israel, right? But before he described himself as the God of Israel, he described himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so there's no question, as we, you know, as you, and if you go back and watch all the messages, it's, it's clear from the scriptures, God has a plan for the Jewish people, amen. But a lot of people think, okay, well, Abraham had this son Isaac, so, and God clearly blessed Isaac, and then Isaac's son Jacob, and Jacob became Israel, and then the 12 tribes, and so forth. So God must have cursed Ishmael. Is that what the text says? Now, the text in, in Genesis 16 would note, uh, I'll note, that uh, Ishmael's descendants are going to be in conflict with Isaac's descendants. Uh, you know, the scriptures talk about uh, brothers are born for adversity. I've got four sons. I can tell you that brothers are born for adversity. Now, my wife and I were not sure, are they born to create adversity or to be there when your other brother is in adversity? I think it's both. I'm just saying. So in 16, Genesis 16, there's no question that the Lord indicates prophetically, and clearly he's been, the Lord's been right, that these two brothers and their families are going to live in some conflict. Yes, but 
did God curse Ishmael and bless Isaac? He certainly blessed Isaac, but let's look in Genesis 17, uh, beginning in verse 18. Now, God has just told Abraham and Sarah that he's going to give them a son through Sarah. He had told them he was going to give them a son, and they're like, great, let's, you know, and he, Sarah ends up giving Abraham to his, to her, her, her maid, not such a good idea, okay? Um, but there's a son out of that, and that's Ishmael. Now, now God is, being, is now telling Abraham and Sarah, I really meant it. When I said I was going to give you a son, I meant through you two. And they're like, you got to be kidding us. We're like 90 and 100, 99. It's not, you know. And the Lord's like, um, let me be in charge of that, okay? You, you, I'll just tell you what's going to happen, and you just believe me, okay? Wouldn't that be nice if we just believe things that seemed impossible in our lives? The Lord says he's going to do things, and we're like, yeah, 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 let me figure out my own way to do it. That never works. Now, in this case, Abraham has this son, Ishmael, and he says, oh, God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Meaning, please, okay, you're going to give me this son, but just please bless Ishmael. May he live before you. May, may you not forget about him because, because Abraham loves him. God says, now stay with me. God says no, but track with me. But Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. Now, again, I would ask, doesn't the word everlasting mean everlasting? In other words, this, this promise that God is uniquely making to Abraham through Isaac to Jacob to the 12 tribes and so forth, that's everlasting. That's an unconditional promise that even the Jews, no matter how much we try, and we have tried historically to sort of shake ourselves loose from God, he, he, he sticks with us. So, so God reaffirms this and makes this very clear. But then he says in verse 20, something really important and really special. The Lord says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will bless him. I will bless him and I will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. He shall become the father of 12 princes and I will make him a great nation. Wow. Wow. God didn't curse Ishmael. He didn't curse Ishmael's descendants. He said there's going to be conflict. Sadly, this all came out of sin. There's going to be consequences, and there's going to be conflict. But the Lord says, I'm going to bless him and make him a great nation. But, verse 21, my covenant, the Lord says, I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you at this season next year. And this is a really important distinction that I just honestly do not hear church leaders around the world teaching that God loves Ishmael. That God loves the children of Ishmael. He has blessed them. He has blessed them differently. It's not that he didn't bless them. It's that he blessed them with different promises, with different uh, goals and aspirations for them than for Isaac. Okay? I think it's similar, though if I haven't dived into controversial uh, waters deep enough, now I'm going to step in a little bit. It's similar to... God's plan and purpose for men and women. God loves us both. He created us both, but he has different roles for men and different roles for women. They're not unequal or inferior. Or it's, God has a plan, and he wants us as men to do our part, to man up, as they say these days, uh, and for women to, serve, to play the part that he has uniquely called them to play. Now, I'm not equating men and women. I'm just saying that would be for us in the church an understanding of, God loves us all. He has different roles for us. And that's clearly what the scriptures begin teaching in Genesis. And it goes all the way through the scriptures. Now, turn with me to a Leviticus chapter 19. Leviticus chapter 19. Beginning in verse 33. The Lord is speaking, of course, through Moses. And he says... When a stranger, now, now okay, context, this is, these, these are laws that go for the Jewish people, the nation of Israel, right? That's what, you know, that's what the book of Leviticus is all about. Now, the Lord says, uh, through Moses, when a stranger resides with you in your land, okay, 
God has given this land to the Jewish people. But when if somebody who's not Jewish is living there, you shall not do him wrong. That seems pretty clear to me, right? The stranger who resides with you shall be as to you as a native among you, and you shall love him as yourself. Why? Because you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And he goes on to talk about not defrauding people and not uh, mistreating them and, and not cheating them. This is interesting, okay? And, and, and where's that verse, as you were aliens in the land of Egypt, and not said, but clearly implied is, and when you were down there, a stranger is in a strange land. Like, it wasn't your land, that's the land of Egypt, and you're Israelites, but when you were there, were you treated well? Were you loved? Were you treated with honesty and fairness and justice? No. You know you weren't. 400 plus years of slavery. Remember that. When I take you to your land, don't do unto those who are not Jewish what people who are not Egyptian did to you, you know, people, what the Egyptians did to you. That's really clear, and yet that's not taught much. The pro-Israel movement, I love the pro-Israel, people who love Israel, I love them. But sometimes, we're not teaching the whole truth. We're not teaching the whole context of the scriptures. And, and, and we're not de- saying, look, there are injustices being done. There are unfairnesses being done. And, and, and the scriptures are clear. Yes, the Lord says, I'm going to choose the Jewish people, bless them, and give them land. But those who are not Jewish in that land, you are not to oppress them. You're not to treat them wrong. You're not to commit injustices. Deuteronomy 14, let's turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 14. You can see I'm not doing line by line, verse by verse this morning, so sort of stay with me and take the notes. We'll also have some of these notes soon up on the uh, website with the, uh, the messages online. But Deuteronomy chapter 14, verses 28 and 29. Again, the Lord, speaking through Moses, says, At the end of every third year, you... You Jewish people, you people of Israel, shall bring out all the tithe of your produce in that year, and you shall deposit it in your town. Now, the Levite, the priest, because he has no portion or inheritance among you, and the alien, meaning the stranger, the non-Jewish person in the area, and the orphan, and the widow who are in your town shall come and eat and be satisfied. In order that the Lord your God may bless you, in all the work of your hand, which you do. See, yeah, God loves the Jewish people. Yes, God has blessed them. Yes, God has given them land. But he's saying, you need to care for, treat well everybody in your land because I will bless you if you do. And the implication is, I'm not going to be happy if you don't. Now turn to the next page, Deuteronomy 16. Deuteronomy 16 Verses 13 and 14. Now we're talking about some of the Jewish festivals. That's the context of this chapter. It's Jewish festivals that Israelites do. Now in verse 13, we said, You shall celebrate the Feast of Booths. It's a fun festival. Uh, the the uh, Feast of Sukkot, and you literally build on your outside or your back porch or something. You build a little hut, and you live there for a little while to remind yourselves as Jews that you once lived not in these nice apartments or homes that you now are in, when you were in Egypt, it was not quite that way. You shall celebrate the Feast of Booth seven days after you have gathered in from your threshing floor and your wine vat. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter and your male and female uh, servants and the Levite and the stranger, meaning the person who's not Jewish but lives in your town, and the orphan and the widow who are in your towns. Seven days you shall celebrate a feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord chooses, because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and all the work of your hands, so that you will all together you will be altogether joyful. You want to be blessed in the land of Israel? Bless your neighbors. Bless those widows and orphans who have nobody to take care of them. This is God's heart, and it's, it's building a pattern that will continue all the way through the Old Testament and into the New. And we who are convicted scripturally of God's heart and plan for Jewish people, we dare not miss God's love 
for the neighbors, his plan for the neighbors, which is a different plan, but it has nothing to do with him not loving them. He, of course, he loves them. Isaiah, turn with me for a moment to Isaiah. Boy, I love this verse. Isaiah chapter 49. Actually, it's not just one verse. Okay, it's two verses in this case. Isaiah 49, verses 6 and 7. The Lord says, It is too small a thing that you, this coming Messiah, should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and restore the preserved ones of Israel. Really? That's too small a thing to to save the Jewish people, to, to come as the Jewish Messiah and, and, and reach them with the good news that God loves them and he wants to transform them and save them and redeem them and use them to be a great blessing to the rest of the world. That's too small a thing? Yes, it is. The father is speaking to the son and he says, it's too small a thing for you just to bless the Jewish people. I will make you also a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. It's too small a thing for the Messiah to just bless Israel. He's going to bless the neighbors. He's going to bless the enemies. He's going to bless everybody. So his salvation message reaches the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel. God's not shedding his his love for Jews and Israel there, but he's saying it's it's bigger than this. And he says it uh, to the despised one, to the one abhorred by the nation, to the servant of the rulers. Kings will see and arise Princes will also bow down because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. In this case, the chosen one in this case is is the Messiah himself, and it's too small a thing just to be a blessing to the Jews, though he first and foremost is. This, This takes us to the book of Romans, right? We are not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of salvation, first for the Jews, and then for the Gentiles, for the whole world. Now, Matthew chapter 4. We're working our way forward. Now we're in Matthew chapter 4. Because all these things that were sort of set into motion, all these biblical principles that were laid down, including this messianic prophecy, is now coming to pass in Matthew chapter 4, beginning in verse 23. Jesus, in Hebrew Yeshua, was going throughout all of Galilee. Okay, TiVo that for one second. How many of you have had the opportunity to to go to Israel before? Okay, that's good, but that's not enough. I want you to pray about coming with Skip and myself uh, to the to an Israel tour next May and to an epicenter conference. I'll talk to you more about that in a moment. But this is exciting when you get to travel through Galilee, and that's one of the things we'll be doing. Yeshua, Jesus, was going throughout all of Galilee. What was he doing? teaching in their synagogues. Well, synagogues, that's Jewish. He was, he was ministering to Jews, right? That seems to make sense. He's the Jewish Messiah. Messiah. He's proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing every kind of disease, every kind of sickness among the people. Now, the news about the Messiah coming and this extraordinary development with, with this person who's speaking words of God and he's doing healings and miracles and And this message doesn't simply spread throughout Israel. Verse 24, the news about him, about Jesus, spread where? Throughout all of Syria. And they, who? The people of Syria. They brought to him all who were ill, those who were suffering with various diseases and pains, um, demon-possessed, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Jesus didn't say, oh, oh, I'm sorry, sorry, time out, You you may have misunderstood. I'm here only for Jews. I, I appreciate you coming all the way from Damascus, but you know, Damascus gets destroyed in Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49. And so, because, so it's all about destruction and curses for you. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I really, I, I can't help you. Is this, the, is this the Messiah that we know and love? No. Why? Because he's fulfilling Isaiah 49. It's too small a thing just to bless Jews. It's certainly going to bless them, but he's going to reach out beyond that. And large crowds, verse 25, large crowds followed him from Galilee and the, and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Now, I've been to the Decapolis. That's on the other side of the, of the Jordan River in the nation that we now call the kingdom of Jordan. And it, it says from beyond the Jordan. It's kind of amazing. God was saying people were coming from Jordan. People are coming from Syria. 
to find the Jewish Messiah. And they were so excited about him. Now, I can't say, just guessing the work of the, uh, the disciples and, and their understanding of all this early on, I'm not guessing they were really thrilled about this. We know that later, Peter can't believe the concept that he's supposed to take the gospel to the Gentiles. I mean, in the book of Acts, he's like, Lord, you've got to be kidding me. I don't even want to, you're not even supposed to touch these people. You're not supposed to even go to their houses. I'm not going to go to Cornelius' house. The Lord commands him to do it. And then he sees that once he preaches the gospel to Cornelius, a Roman occupier, a Roman centurion, Cornelius comes to faith. He and his whole household get saved. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. And Peter's like, that's kind of funny. Apparently, God loves Gentiles. Who, you know, who knew? <laughs> now, bless Peter. I mean, he wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer, right? I mean, I'm not saying we all are either. But isn't it interesting that the early church, the Jewish believers were like, I don't think God loves the Gentiles. In fact, if you go to Acts chapter 11, the, the, the church fathers, the, the, the other apostles, they call them up to... Peter back to Jerusalem and saying, what are you doing? What are you, have you completely gone crazy? You can't go doing stuff with the Gentiles. And he said, let me tell you the story of what happened. God is pouring out his mercy on the Gentiles. Who knew? Now, Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45, just one page over. Jesus, who... I'm guessing at this point knows that his disciples are a little, you know, put out by the idea that Jesus is ministering to Syrians and Jordanians. They weren't called that at the time, but that these neighbors were getting blessed. You know, because remember, you know, these disciples are at times when people came around Jesus that they didn't like. They're like, Lord, would you like us to call fire down from heaven and consume these people? He's like, oh my gosh, no, no, <laughs> no. No, I mean, but that's, sorry, that, that's our instinct sometimes is, you know, you know, Israel's got enemies, nuke them till they glow. <laughs> that's sort of the Texas, I, I, as I understand it, sort of nuke them till they glow. No, no, Lord. now, that's not to say there won't be wars and rumors of wars and all kinds of conflict. That's prophesied. But that's not the Lord's heart. <laughs> the Lord doesn't want to, you know, consume people by fire. That's not his first instinct. Sometimes it's the church's. And it shouldn't be. Jesus says, and so responding to this, I think, in verse 43, he says to his disciples and to the people at, uh, up in the Galilee, this is where the sermon's going on, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor. Well, that, they've heard that because that's in the Old Testament. <laughs> uh, and you've heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. That's not in the Old Testament. <laughs> but I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who's in heaven. For he causes his sun to rise on the evil and the good, and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Jesus is saying, yes, you should love your neighbor. And some people are going, I'm not, they're not neighbors, they're enemies. So Jesus says, okay, love your enemies. Ah, Newman, you know, that pretty much covers everybody. I mean, here's the Jewish Messiah standing in Israel saying, love your neighbors. And, you know, of course, you have later people going, uh, who's our neighbor? You know, like, they're trying to, in some ways, get out of, you don't really actually mean people who aren't Jewish, do you? Yes, I do. And um, as well as people who are Jewish. <laughs> um, and then they say, well, we don't really consider these people neighbors. They're, they're enemies. Okay, Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And I can guarantee you, from traveling through that region, uh, the love your enemy strategy, we followers of Jesus Christ pretty much have that one all to ourselves. No one else is trying this. Imagine if we were to obey these principles, how the church would be set on fire. And I, maybe fire would be the wrong analogy in that case, but I mean, to grow significantly. Matthew chapter 15. See a pattern building here? So we work our way through scripture. Matthew 15, in verse 21, Jesus goes away from there. Where, where was he? In the Galilee. He goes away from there, and he withdraws into the district of Tyre and Sidon. Now, where is that? That's southern Lebanon. Now, a Canaanite woman, meaning not a Jewish person, a neighbor, 
theoretically an enemy in this case, right? The Canaanites were enemies of the Jewish people. She cries out, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. And Jesus did not answer her a word. And the disciples came and implored her, implored him, saying, could, could you just send her away? Because she keeps shouting at us. The lady's crazy. She said, please help me. And they see it as annoying. This is a Canaanite. We're in Lebanon. They're probably thinking, why are we in Lebanon anyway? Did he get lost? Doesn't he have a GPS? Isn't he the Messiah? I mean, come on. What are we doing up here? This is, this is not friendly territory. And this woman keeps crying out for mercy. And Jesus gives it to her. Now, he challenges her first. It's interesting, and I don't fully understand it, to be just candid. Jesus answers and says, I'm sorry, I was, he doesn't say I'm sorry, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and began, and she bows down before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, and he said, now he challenges her again, and said, is it not, is it not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs? But she said, yes, Lord, but even the dogs feed on the crumbs from which, which fall from their master's table. She is so determined to get the Messiah to bless her and her child, her daughter, to be set free from Satan, that she's willing to humble herself and beg. And the disciples wouldn't have any of it. Could you just sort of get her away because she's shouting at us. Well, darn right. Her daughter is possessed by a demon. And Jesus tests her to see how much faith does she really have in a Jewish Messiah. And she did. In fact, and I would argue she had more faith at that moment than some of the disciples were uh, uh, demonstrating. And Jesus says to her, Oh woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. See, this is God's heart. He loves the Jews, and he loves the neighbors, and he loves the enemies, and he calls us to do the same. You know, once you start going through the gospel uh, messages or the, 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 about presenting the gospel, what do you see? You see in Matthew 24, 14, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, this gospel of the kingdom, this good news that you can be saved through faith in Jesus Christ, shall be preached. Where? Only in Israel? No. In the whole world. As a testimony to all nations. And then the end shall come. God's heart for the Jews, but also for the rest of the world. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, right? This is where God says, Jesus says to his disciples, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. And what? Just Tell Jewish people about Jesus? No. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, and lo, I'll be with you, even to the end of the age, even to the end of the end of the days of, uh, prophetically given for the world. Jesus said he'll be with us as we go and we make disciples of all nations, not just friendly nations, not just capitalist nations, not just democracies, but difficult nations. Dangerous nations, deadly nations. This is our God. This is his heart. And this is our call. Jesus himself said it very clearly. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved just the Jewish people that he can't... Oh, I'm sorry. Let me... Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. He, God so loved the world that he came, that he gave his only begotten son. And if only Jewish people believe, then they... Oh, no, actually, whosoever believes. A Jew like my father... A Gentile like my mother, whosoever believes, a Rosenberg like me or my Lebanese brother-in-law, whosoever believes in him, in Jesus Christ as the Messiah, not just of Jews, but of the whole world, whoever believes in him shall not perish and die and go to hell forever and ever and ever separated from God with no hope, but shall have eternal life. Acts 1.8, the gospel goes forth from Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, and then just stops there. No. The Lord Jesus tells his disciples that when he gives the Holy Spirit, and when he comes upon, the Holy Spirit comes upon them in power, they will have the power to take the gospel from Jerusalem 
to Judea and Samaria. By the way, Judea and Samaria is now what the world calls the occupied West Bank. But take the gospel there from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. This, tell, this sums up the whole thing. The heart of God starts in Genesis. We bring it to Revelation. And when you get to Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, what are we seeing? The apostle John, a Jewish believer, says, I looked, and behold, a great multitude. Where were they? They were in heaven. He could see them in heaven, which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes. See, the early Jewish believers didn't believe God loved the Gentiles. That was a flaw in their theology, and it, and it was corrected by the Lord. Many Gentiles today in the church believe that God doesn't love the Jews. That's a flaw, and it needs to be corrected. And it is being corrected by the Holy Spirit. We dare not go to either extreme. God loves the Jewish people, and he loves the neighbors. And what's amazing to me is that more neighbors and more enemies are coming to faith in Jesus Christ than the Jews. I'm insanely jealous. More Muslims have come to faith in Jesus Christ in the last three decades than in the last 14 centuries put together. And, and I, as a Rosenberg, out there doing this work, teaching on these things, I'm amazed how God has asked me to begin building friendships with Palestinians, with Iranians, with Iraqis. And it's been exciting, <laughs> you know, because... You know, when, uh, for me, who was a, in an aide uh, you know, for a season working for uh, then former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, now the current Prime Minister, you know, I, I don't imagine myself ever going to meet with Iranian radical Muslims. Now, I have not been to Iran itself. My Iranian friends say I could probably get a visa in. <laughs> not so sure, given what I'm teaching and saying, if I would be able to get out. So, um, but I have a friend named Hormoz, Sharia. Hormoz Shariat, in 1979, he and his wife were radical Muslims, Shia Muslims in Iran. Every Friday, when millions of radical Shia Muslims would show up for the Ayatollah Khomeini to give a death to America, death to Israel sermon, which was pretty much every weekend, uh, they would show up and say, death to America, he and his wife, every week. And then they thought, mm, okay, well, maybe not death to America quite yet. We'd like to go to graduate school over there. So, so they applied to school in Southern California. They got in. They got visas somehow into our country. I mean, it, it all worked out, but you think, what was going on there? But um, they get there, and what happens? They start going through culture shock, weather shock, food shock, traffic shock. I mean, they were really, their marriage starts breaking up, and, and things are not going well, and they actually set a date for their divorce. Islam was not helping them, wasn't bringing them the peace they expected, they needed, and it wasn't happening. Now the wife got befriended by some young women at a local church. They showed her love, and they said, well, why don't you come to church with us? Okay. So she goes to church, she gets saved. She becomes a follower of Jesus Christ. The husband's like, you gotta be kidding me. I mean, he, goes, he freaks out. But after a little while, he thinks, well, she does seem nicer to me. <laughs> so what's the deal with that? I mean, I thought we were radical Muslims, so that's not doing anything for us. So he starts a, an intensive study of the Quran and the Bible. And he concludes that the Bible, not the Quran, is the word of God, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father except through Christ. And he gives his life to the Lord. These two cancel the divorce. They start growing in their faith. After a few years, they plant a congregation of Iranian Muslims who have left Islam and become followers of Christ. It's the largest Iranian ex-Muslim congregation in the nation. Then they think, how are we going to reach our nation? We, we're not allowed back in. So they start using the satellite television. And God starts using them. He, Hormoz Shariat, I like to describe him as the Billy Graham of Iran. He's preaching the gospel from San Jose on satellite television. It's watched at 9 o'clock primetime television uh, in Iran. People are sitting there watching. Do you know it's illegal to own a satellite dish 
in Iran, which is why everyone has one. <laughs> These days, the, the, the people of Iran hate their government so much that the government says no. They're like, okay. <laughs> and so people are sitting there flipping through, okay, state-run television, state-run television, state-run television, soccer, state-run television, state-run television, you know, some guy's saying something about Jesus. What was that? Go back. And people are watching, and you can call in live. So, so Hormoz and I got to be friends, and I wrote about him in the book Inside the Revolution. We, we included him in the documentary film Inside the Revolution. So he invites me to come out to California and, and be on his show. And I say, brother, <laughs> brother, uh, you want me to share the gospel and teach Bible prophecy live on sal- satellite television into Iran? He said, yes. Actually, have you gone, have you gone crazy? A guy named Rosenberg who worked for Netanyahu who loves Israel? Isn't that like not the message you're trying to send? He goes, I think that would be interesting. It'd be like counter-programming. I said, yeah. <laughs> I said, I don't know, brother. I got to think about it. I got to pray about that. I'm not, it's not like I'm scared, but I, I'm not scared of Iranians. I'm scared of Jesus. I, I don't want to wind up in heaven one day and have him say, Joel, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. And I, just, can we just, uh, I just need a second here. Uh, t- did I see you on Hormoz Shariat's television show into Iran? I mean, <laughs> What was that? You know, I, don't want, I had a real good thing, good thing going with Hormoz until you showed up. I didn't want to do that. But after several years of us both praying about it, uh, this April, I had the opportunity to go on. I, I flew out there, and, and I, for two days, I was on this satellite television program. And Iranians were calling in from Iran, Shia Muslims, as well as Iranians who live in different places. And they were calling in with live questions about the gospel and about why, you're, Joel, you're teaching from the scriptures that God loves Israel's neighbors and her enemies? You're saying that God has a plan and a purpose for the people of Iran? Yes, I am. And we started seeing Shia Muslims pray to receive Christ on the air. This is, you know, it's an important thing when Jewish people not only know our Savior, but say publicly, God loves the people of Iran. He loves the Palestinians. He loves the people of that region. It's important for us to say it. And it's important uh, for us to show it. You know, Ephesians chapter 2 is about one new man, that the divi- dividing wall between the Gentiles being hostile to Jews and Jews being hostile to Gentiles, that's supposed to come down when Jesus Christ has changed us, when he's transformed us, when he's filled us with his Holy Spirit. And we have just seen some amazing things. I'm going to land the plane here in a moment, but I want to tell you one other story. Uh, I, I like to tell you a lot of stories. I'll save a, a few of them, I guess, for tonight. But if I can just take uh, two more minutes. I, we was, um, a woman, the, the chief newscaster in Damascus, in Syria, uh, one of the leading newscasters is a woman. Uh, she's sort of like the Katie Couric of Syria. I mean, she has better ratings than Katie, but still, she's <laughs> highly regarded, and she's really widely, very well respected. So anyway, she read a book called More Than a Carpenter by Josh McDowell that had been translated into Arabic. So, and she comes to faith. She's like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. She becomes a believer in Jesus. She starts studying the scriptures, and she's like, oh my gosh, Syria is in here a lot. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus, the news about Jesus is spreading into Syria. In Acts chapter 9, the apostle Paul comes to faith on the road to Syria, on the road to Damascus. And she, oh my goodness, the, the, the believers in Jesus were first called Christians. Where? in Antioch, in Syria. She's like, this is news. Then she comes to her senses and thinks, well, it's 2,000-year-old news. I can't really put it on tonight's show. So she decides to write and produce a documentary film about how Saul was a religious terrorist on his way to Damascus and then came to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and, and they, she made this documentary film. She's walking down Straight Street uh, in Damascus. It's still there. And she's explained, this is where it happened. This is Judas's house. This is where Saul, was, his eyes were opened. And it's just an amazing film. Then she thought, oh, oh, I got a problem. She and her colleagues, they're like, uh, we can't show this film here. We live in a country run by Bashar al-Assad. The guy's a terrorist. He's friends, buddies with Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. They're like, oh, we can't show this. I, I mean, but they had it done. So they asked people to pray, and I was one of the people they asked, would you pray that God would open this door for this Damascus film, that's what they call it, Damascus, to be shown? So I, I, I said yes, but I have to tell you, I thought there's just no way. It's never gonna happen. I mean, I don't have the faith for that. I, I, I'm just being honest with you. So she gets a call a couple weeks later from the senior advisor to the president, Bashar al-Assad, 
And he says, the president likes the film very much, very impressed with the role of Syria in Christendom, and he would like you to premiere the film at his personal movie theater on March 2nd. <laughs> She's like, who is this really? You know, <laughs> I mean, what a, wow. And March 2nd, that was the last year. So she is thinking, okay, well, uh, she says, well, the only thing is, Your Excellency, Your Excellency I, you know, I'm very grateful, that's very nice, but the only thing is we don't really have the money to put on a big, lavish, you know, gala premiere. We were just thinking, you know, could we just have permission to show it anywhere? He said, well, I will get back to you. Calls back a couple days later. The president said, don't worry about it. He will take care of everything. He will pay for everything, and the Minister of Culture, he will be in charge of the invitations. Now you just give your list of all the Christians you want, we will invite all the Muslim leaders and the government cabinet, and they will show it. And that's what happened March 2nd of last year. God presented the gospel in a film called Damascus in Damascus. Now after that was done, just to give you the Paul Harvey rush to the story, uh, we get, I mean, that was amazing. And I can't tell you that I had the faith for that. But we got a call from one of the producers on the film that I knew, and he said, listen, uh, we now have permission, we didn't just show the film, we have permission to produce 300,000 copies of, of this Damascus film on DVD and distribute it all throughout Syria and, and other places. Would the Joshua Fund be willing to fund the $300,000 cost to do this project? I thought, the Joshua Fund, you know, to bless Israel, you know, with Jewish people, right? But no, that's not our mission statement. Our mission statement is to mobilize Christians to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus according to Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Those are the famous verses, right? God says, I will bless those who bless the children of Abraham and curse those who curse them. Now, yes, Isaac and the Jewish people were some of those children, but so was Ishmael. And so as we prayed about as a team, we thought this would be an incredible honor. We don't know where we're going to get the money, but yes, we will do it. And the Lord provided. And we thought this is part of our mission statement. This is God's call on our heart. What better than a, than a Rosenberg and, and the team that God has given us to go bless our brothers and sisters as believers in that country, reaching the unbelievers. Because Isaiah 17 and Jeremiah 49 says, Damascus will be destroyed. Someday, in the end times, I can't tell you when, that city is going to be obliterated. And I don't want to stand before Jesus Christ one day and have him say, you had an opportunity to help your Arab brothers and sisters in Christ reach that city and that country with the gospel, and you said no? Didn't you understand anything that I was doing here? Didn't you understand the news about me was spreading into Syria? You had a chance to bless Israel and her neighbors with, when there was still time. Friends, I just ask you to ask the Lord, Lord, ask the two questions that Paul asked on the road to Damascus. Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me to do? Those are good questions. Who are you, Lord? Let me know you better. Let me see you more clearly. Help me follow you more closely. Who are you? Reveal yourself to me, Lord. And what would you have me to do? And I ask you, as we close this service now and um, prepare for the Q&A tonight, what is the Lord asking you to do? I would hope that some of you, the Holy Spirit is stirring to come with Skip and myself to Israel next May and to be part of this tour. You'll meet Israeli believers. You'll meet Arab believers. You'll meet people in ministry on both sides. We will be having this epicenter conference. Skip will be teaching. Uh, Ray Bentley from Maranatha Chapel. Anne Graham Lotz. Kay Arthur. Myself. Some other people we're not ready to re uh, release yet. Uh, the names. It's going to be amazing. You're going to see how God is moving. And how the day of the Lord is coming. And we're supposed to teach it. And be a blessing to Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus. The jo I would also encourage you to get involved in the Joshua Fund. Uh, where I'll be signing books in a few minutes, there'll be a Joshua Fund table. One of my colleagues is here, a Jewish believer in Jesus, who loves Israel and her neighbors. Ask him questions. We've got information you can learn about praying with us, maybe financially getting involved as well. We would appreciate that. This is a moment for the church to realize and then to teach consistently and with great love God's heart for Jews 
his heart for the neighbors, and his heart for the enemies. Because we're going into a deep and intense battle. And I just want to end with this point. Some of you are thinking, aren't you saying there could be some massive war between Israel and the enemies next year? Yes, I am. And now you want me to go with Skip and you to Israel and do this con be part of this conference? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, what is the deal with that, son? I mean, hello. I know, I know. Listen, if there are missiles inbound for Israel at that moment, that's what travel insurance is for. Okay? <laughs> If the war is imminent, I mean, if it's any moment, everything is getting ready, that's what travel insurance is for. I'm not asking you, Skip and I are not asking you to come into a hot zone, a missile zone. That's what our staff is, that's what I will do. That's what I've already done when the missile war was inbound with southern Israel last year. Our team went, I went. As bombs were dropping, we were delivering food and other relief supplies in the name of Jesus. That's what our job is. We're not asking you to do that, but we, we, we would like you to pray about coming. And maybe... It would be special if, if true followers of Christ came and prayed for the peace of Jerusalem in Jerusalem, lifted up the name of our king of kings in the city of the great king, was a blessing to Israel and her neighbors right there where Jesus started the church and said, you will be my witnesses when my Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses with great power in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria even to Albuquerque. May God bless you as you ask the Lord, who are you, Lord? Reveal yourself to me and show me what I'm to do. Thank you so much. Subscribe to our videos by clicking the subscribe button. You'll find some videos that we've chosen specifically for you. And if this is a ministry that you'd like to support financially, just make a tax deductible donation by clicking here to visit our giving page. Thank you. We look forward to partnering with you to bless Israel and her neighbors in the name of Jesus.